day out. It's days like this that make you thankful you live up here in the high desert. It's the middle of August when it's 112 degrees when you wonder why you live up here in the high desert. As it has already been mentioned, and it will be mentioned at least two more times, if you are visiting with us, you truly are our honored guests. We don't just say this because they are words to say. We say them because they are coming from the heart. And we pray that in our worship to God together this morning, that each and every one of us will be edified by the hymns that have been sung, the prayers that have been led, the word of God which is about to be broken, and that God would be glorified by our worship to him. That is our singular purpose here this morning. You know, I woke up this morning, and God spoke to me. And he told me that I was supposed to do a lesson on how God speaks to people today. If you believe that God spoke to me, you're misunderstanding his word. There are many in the world that say God has spoken with them. Many, many years ago when I first obeyed the gospel and I knew little to nothing about the word of God, a brother and I, the brother that shared the gospel with me, used to have a Bible study during lunchtime and there was one of the co-workers, happened to be a woman, she said, well, can I join in the Bible study? Absolutely. So we were studying, and, and I don't recall specifically what we were studying at the time, but she said that God spoke to her. And so I asked her, I said, well, how is he speaking to you? Is it audibly? Right? Is it a feeling you have? How is he speaking to you? And why is he speaking to you and not others? So she gave me an example. She said, well, let's say you were driving and you came to like a fork in the road and you're unsure on which way to go. She said that God would speak to her and let her know which way to go. I said, did God ever make a mistake? She goes, what do you mean? I said, well, did you ever take a path that he told you to take and that path wasn't necessarily the right path? So we use that as an opportunity to share with her how God speaks to us today. How does God speak to us today? Does he speak to us audibly? Uh, Rod, thank you for that reading. In Hebrews chapter 1, God is very specific in how he speaks to mankind today. I'm going to give you a heads up. This is kind of a scripturally heavy sermon. We're going to be looking at quite a number of passages of scripture because I believe these passages will make the point much better than I ever could. Hebrews 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past, right, to the fathers. God spoke to Adam. God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Abraham. He spoke to them. Now, I don't know if it was just in their mind or if it was audible, but he spoke directly with them. Verse 2, has in these last days, we're in the last days, has spoken to us by his son. God speaks to us today, God speaks to the world today, through his son. As Jesus spoke to any of you this morning, he didn't speak to me. I was real quiet. I was sitting in the living room. 
going over this, and I was hoping he'd speak to me, but he didn't. But then when I opened up the Word, and I started to go over what my lesson would be, all of a sudden he began to speak to me. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. God speaks to humanity today through his word. The Hebrew writer teaches us that the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Cutting even to the division of bone and marrow and there is nothing hidden from him. He speaks to us today through his word. If you want to know God's will for your life, you must go to the word of God. The Hebrew writer was trying to encourage the Jewish Christians to remain faithful to the New Testament. The book of Hebrews is about a better everything than the law. We have a better everything. And we're going to look at a few of those passages this morning. His son is superior to angels. Staying in Hebrews 1, let's look at verses 4 through 6. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Christ is superior to angels. Staying in the book of Hebrews, flip over to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Moses was amazing. Moses had a relationship with God unlike any other mortal. But Jesus' relationship as the son of God is superior to Moses' relationship. The Jews looked to Moses. They looked to David. They looked to men of God, but they weren't the son of God. And there's a difference. We have a superior high priest. If you would, flip over to Hebrews chapter 5. We know that only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies in the temple, in the tabernacle. We have a superior high priest. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. But it was he who said to him, the he they're saying to him is God speaking to his son. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. If you haven't studied Melchizedek, I would encourage you to study Melchizedek. 
There's not much in the word of God about Melchizedek. But if you understand Melchizedek, you'll understand more exactly what it is saying here in Hebrews 5 verse 6. So I would encourage you to look at that. We don't have time this morning. We have a superior mediator. Has anybody went to a mediator? I had to go to a mediator a couple times when I was at a job and there were some people that were bringing charges against the, the job and we had to go to a mediator. We have a superior mediator. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse number 6. But now, he has obtained, the he there is Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read it saying Jesus. But now, Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. Inasmuch as Jesus is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. God made a covenant with Abram. He changed his name to Abraham. His covenant is that he would make him the father of many nations. We have a mediator that stands between us and our God. He stands between us and our God unlike anybody else could. What makes him superior? His blood. Staying in Hebrews, flip over to Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 11 and 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle. Remember the Jews had a tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. The tabernacle was built by hands. Jesus' tabernacle was not built by hands. Verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and of calves, but with his own blood. That's just, again, there are things that I look at in the word of God, and it so humbles me that the Christ would leave his place in heaven and come here and walk on this terra and go to a cross and shed his blood for me, for you. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place. Once for all, one time, having obtained eternal redemption. If you understood, the high priest would have to go in once a year and make atonement for the sins of Israel, sins of the Jews. Those sins were carried on. They weren't fully forgiven. They were fully forgiven at the cross. But they were just kicking that can down the road till Christ came. And once Christ came and was crucified on the cross, all those sins of their past were done away through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have a superior new covenant. Remember, God made a covenant with Abraham. We have a new covenant. Looking at Hebrews chapter 10,
I'm going to read 8 through 10. Previously saying, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, that he may establish a second. By this, we have been sanctified. We have been set apart by this. By what? By him coming and setting up a new covenant. The offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You hear the time from time to time if you watch any type of legal show that somebody has a last will and testament. You might have five wills. Which one is the one that's in effect? The last will and testament. Christ came for a new covenant, a new will. This, the first will is done away with. We're not under that covenant. We're not under that will. We're under the new covenant. We're under a new will. Hence the new testament. There is a strong warning to those who have been tempted to leave Christ for the old law. Again, I love being able to do this. If you're not able to get here Sunday morning starting at 9.30, Rod, and for the next two lessons will be Reggie, Rod is going line by line through different books of the Bible. He is currently going through the book of Romans. Chapter 11, we're on about verse 24, 25, somewhere in there. But it's line for line. And if you were here this morning for the lesson, there were a couple questions that came up. And without naming anybody, and I'm not saying this because I want anybody to be embarrassed, that's why I'm not going to name names. Something came up that somebody was a little unsure of. And that was addressed. That is the whole point of the Bible study. We all grow together. We all come to this with our own life experience. We all come to this with a way in which we were taught to study. There was a sister I was just talking to this morning. I said, nowhere in the Bible does it say read the Bible. There's nothing wrong with reading the Bible. It says, study to show thyself approved. We are to study this. In many ways, we're being examined. We're being tested right now. The answers to the test are here. Could you imagine a teacher when you were in school that said, hey, there's going to be a history test and all the answers are going to be in chapters 1 and 2? What would you be studying? Chapters 1 and 2. Because when the test came, you wanted to make sure you had the answers. Everything we need to be obedient to God, everything we need to go from death to life is here. God does exist. Much of the world believes that God does not exist. I have a couple lessons that I'm coming on. They're not science lessons, but they're on how science proves God. Science never proves that God doesn't exist. It always proves that he does exist. Let's look at real quickly. If you want to write down, write down Psalm 14 and verse 1. But then turn... To Psalm 53 and verse 1. 
The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable inequity. There is none who does good. For whatever reason, the more intelligent man thinks they are, that somehow removes God from their knowledge because they get puffed up themselves. The world would tell you that there was nothing, and then from nothing, life came into existence. We know that you cannot get life from non-life. This is a fact scientists know. So why is it that they keep pushing that narrative? You can't go out and, and look at the creation. The heavens declare have you ever been somewhere where it's just so beautiful? Lynette and I look at this guy. Somehow, I don't know his name. He's able to stack boulders in middle of rivers. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's amazing. And they're at angles like you think there's no way they could possibly be that way. Now, do you think there's, and he just leaves them. Could you imagine anybody walking through the forest and you come upon that and you see these rocks stacked in a certain way and you think, wow, how that best they just happened to get like that? No, your mind would tell you something made them in that shape. Yet the intelligence of this world wants to say everything we see, everything that is taking place is just this accident. If we were this much closer to the moon, it would affect the tides. If we were that much further from the sun, we'd freeze. Everything that is maintained in, in the heavens declares God's glory. God exists. I try to imagine on that day of judgment, and you've denied God, you've suppressed him, you, you've pushed him so far down that he couldn't rise up in your thoughts. And, and that day of judgment and you're standing there, I don't know how far your jaw could drop. Well, can I get a, a, a no? It's too late then. We have to make a decision before that day. You don't get a second chance. God speaks to men today through his word. He sets us apart through his word. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them. Set us apart. Set who apart? Those that are going to obey the gospel. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We are set apart by the word of God. Who is the word of God? Jesus Christ. In the beginning, John 1.1 1, 1 was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He, Jesus Christ, was in the beginning with God. And nothing was made that was made that wasn't made through him. You drop down to about verse 14 in uh, John 1. It says, and he, he there, became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's look at John chapter 6. Gospel of John chapter 6. Verses 45 and 46. It is written in the prophets, 
and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. The Bible never uses the word Trinity. There's nothing wrong with using the word Trinity. The Bible uses the term Godhead. I've been asked by people before, well, can you explain the Godhead? No. No. I have a finite mind. But I know that's what's taught in the Word of God. That there is the Father, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. And they are all one. I try to use the way I can think to try to explain it. I'm Robert the Son. I'm Robert the Father. I also have a spirit that really doesn't explain it, right? You have liquid water, you can have frozen water, and you can have vapor water. It's all water in three different states. That's how I kind of try to wrap my head around it. But all I know is that that is what is taught in the word of God. Look at Matthew 17 in verse 5. Again, he speaks to us through his son. Matthew 17, verse 5. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. We need to hear the Son. God has spoken through his words. John 12 and verse 48. John 12, verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. What are we going to be judged by? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. If you're writing down scriptures, write down 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The word was recorded and preserved for us to read and to study. Then if you would, flip over to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. I'll read one through four for the context. Ephesians 3, one through four. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written today, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul wrote so that we would understand the mystery. If you aren't studying to show thyself approved, then how will you know the mystery? Sadly, many of the world, when they obey the gospel, that's where their study ends. And then the cares of this world come in and choke it out. And they end up leaving. Uh, 
I have time. Flip over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, and then we'll be closing. Verse number 11, following. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God of God. Jesus is the word of God. We are saved through Jesus Christ. Which means we are saved through the word of God. How is one saved? Where do we go to find out how somebody is saved? There's many teachings out in the world about how somebody is saved. Whenever there's disagreement over scripture, whether it's a brother or sister in Christ that you guys have a different understanding of a passage, or if it's the world's understanding and the body of Christ's understanding, if there are two different understandings of a passage of scripture, there are two facts. Both understandings could be incorrect. That's a fact. Both people could be misunderstanding it. Or one is correct and the other is incorrect. There's not two correct. There can only be one correct. There can be two incorrects, but only one correct. So when we need to consider what we have to do to be saved, we have to compare what is taught in the world by what is taught in the Word of God. And if what the world says doesn't match up with what the Word of God says, then we have to go with what the Word of God says. It doesn't matter what man says saves us. It only matters what Jesus says saves us. So what saves us? The Bible says that we're saved by grace. That's it. Saved by grace, I'm done. The Bible says that I'm saved by faith. Okay, faith, I don't need the grace, I got the faith. I'm saved by faith, I'll do the faith thing. There's many other passages that I could list, but I'm out of time. What would the simplest thing to do be? I'm kind of simple in the way I approach life. And... If I saw you do something and you were successful at it, I'd come to you and I'd say, can you show me what you did? Because I want to get to where you are. Well, the Bible tells us what they did in the first century. There were steps that were taken that moved you from death to life, from darkness to light. Hear the word of God. Remember, again, we're saved through the word. Now, it's his son that did what we couldn't do by being hung on the cross and shedding his blood, rising up the third day, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But we need to hear it. We need to study it. We need to understand it. Then if you believe it, because everybody that reads it doesn't believe it, but if you believe it, it's going to cause you to understand the state that you're living in. And if you understand the state that you're living in, which is separate and apart from God, it'll cause you to, what do I have to do to be saved? How do I go from there? How do I get back to the Father? 
That question was asked by Peter on the day of, to Peter on the day of Pentecost. Peter, what must we do? Repent. Turn back to God. He's waiting for you to turn back. And when you turn back, he's going to run towards you faster than you could ever run towards him. And then be baptized for the remission or unto the forgiveness of your sins. This is God's way. If there's anyone here this morning that needs to obey the gospel, if there's anyone here that needs the prayers or the help of this congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing. Oh,